I'm very glad to be here today <clears throat> because one of the reasons is that I've been given an opportunity to speak about my art, which is very close to my heart. And that this whole place is filled up with uh, a beautiful scroll of drawings done by an old lady called Santokpa. It's amazing, actually. She has covered the entire history of our nation from pre-independence to till Indraji's death. I would say that this is a kind of uh, scroll which can easily represent uh, the art of comic strip, which goes back to quite a few hundred years when it started in the world. And in fact, in Rajasthan and other places also, in Rajasthan you have Babuji Ki Pad, which is uh, a folk hero, and his life story is is illustrated on a scroll of cloth. And uh, there are two folk singers who would unroll that scroll. And along with that, they sing the story of Babuji, the folk hero of Rajasthan. So in a sense, even before cartooning or comic strip was invented in the West, in India, we had done it. And we had done it with more effect, much more effect, because it was not just the drawing, but there was music and sound with that also. Political cartooning is dying, an un untimely death in India. In the intellectual circles, the conversation often revolves around this topic these days. Wherever I go, people ask me, political cartooning is dying in the country. Some, pe some people feel very nostalgic about it and uh, they remember the legends like Shankar. They talk about uh, the magazines like Shankar's Weekly and talk about old days when cartooning was thriving in this country. Is political cartooning really dying? Or is it rather close to extinction? Or is it already dead? Well, these are some of the questions we would make an effort to find answers to, but we'll do that later. Let us look at various aspects of political cartooning. We are not studying cartooning here, and let me state that I'm here to share some of my very simple and straightforward thoughts, ideas, and experiences about this great art form with all of you. Let me recall the story of the emperor's clothes. You've all heard it. There was a child who had the innocence and the courage to tell the emperor that he had no clothes. He told the truth. That is the role of the cartoonist. That child is the cartoonist. We play the role of that child with the innocence and the truthfulness we tell the emperors and the prime ministers and the ministers that they have no clothes. I would say that India is a paradise for cartoonists. Because most of the politicians here work for the cartoonists and not for the people. <laughs> well, cartooning has been through many ups and downs in the past century in India. If I recall I mean, the history of Indian cartooning, it, I can date it back to sometime in 1920s, 30s, 40s. In 30s, actually, Shankar started working for Bombay Chronicle in Bombay. And later on, he joined Hindustan Times. Uh, and he is one cartoonist who, may, who actually used cartooning as a weapon against the British rulers. And cartooning is a weapon, actually. We have a rich tradition of cartooning in India. My newspaper, the Hindustan Times, can easily take credit for introducing the art of cartooning in India because Shankar was the first cartoonist, major first cartoonist of India, and uh, Hindustan Times was the first newspaper which ever introduced any cartoonist in this country. So HT and Shankar can both share that credit of being the first cartoonist in India and being the first newspaper to have cartoons on its staff. 
So I think that from Shankar to Sudhir Tailang, it's been an interesting journey. From Pandit Nehru to Manmohan Singh, no Prime Minister has disappointed us cartoonists. In the past two decades or so, I have had the privilege of drawing many Prime Ministers. Most of them invented solely for the purpose, for the cause of cartooning. Indraji, whose birth anniversary falls today, we are celebrating it today, was no exception actually. She was a great cartoon lover. On Nehruji's birthday, one year, she went to Shankar Pillai and asked for some of the original drawings he had done on Shankar. So he collected 20 of them and gifted it to Nehruji on his birthday as a birthday present. Well, my career as a political cartoonist began in 1982. Before that, I was studying in college in Rajasthan. Indraji was Prime Minister at that time. Everybody thought that a long and sharp nose and a white streak of hair <clears throat> was all that you needed to do a caricature of Indraji. <clears throat> but her personality, I believe, extended far beyond the white streak of hair or a sharp nose, beyond that, uh, the two trademark features that she had. It's not just the external features that actually matter in a caricature or the likeness that doesn't actually matter. What matters is something beyond the external features, something beyond the canvas. If you can capture that, then actually you actually capture the soul and the atma of that person. I'll illustrate it later with one or two examples. David Lowe, a great cartoonist of England, once very succinctly and very truly said, that a caricature is not what you look like, but what you ought to look like. Not what you look like, but what you ought to look like. So cartoonists captured, in, captured Indiraji's personality in the caricature truly. Her supreme self-confidence, her autocratic streak, her snootiness, her strength of character. In that caricature, you could see everything. Ever, uh, 82 and 284, these were only two years when I was able to draw her cartoons and I, I was trying to capture and study her personality. But before I could actually master her caricature, she was assassinated. And I thought that my career was over with Indiraji's assassination. And Rajiv Gandhi was hardly the stuff cartoons are made of. A frightening prospect for any cartoonist because he was too handsome to be caricatured and too innocent to be ridiculed. At least in his initial days, actually. But there is some hidden force that propels all the prime ministers to the drawing board of the cartoonist. The relationship between the cartoonist and the prime ministers is almost like uh, that of a moth and the flame. They come towards the flame to be killed. The six-month period is a honeymoon with the people and after that a special honeymoon begins with the cartoonist. <laughs> so Rajiv Gandhi did not fail us. VP Singh, Chandrasekhar, Deve Gowda, I.K. Gujral, no Prime Minister has disappointed the cartoonists. Mr. Manmohan Singh did not disappoint my tribesmen when he was Finance Minister. And there is no reason why he should disappoint us now as Prime Minister. We have high hopes on him. El Kadwani is one politician who, was, uh, who has dominated the cartooning scene in spite, of the fact that, in spite of the fact that he has never been Prime Minister. But still he has dominated the scene of cartooning for past many years. He's a dream come true for cartoonists. The dream begins from his head. Shining. Smooth. Then the toothbrush moustache. His shy eyes and not so shy brand of politics. <laughs> what else, I mean, a cartoonist could ask for? He has evolved to be one of the main source of bread and butter for us cartoonists. In that sense, I'm indebted to him. For some of the credit for my success as a cartoonist goes to him. But the most of the credit for my success as a cartoonist goes to Mr. Narsim Rao. Rao still to date remains my favorite number one. He is my hero number one. 
He was the best prime minister that any cartoonist could ask for. Flaring nostrils and a big pout, which almost became a landmark of Delhi during those years. It's interesting to see how a scholar, elder statesman, can evolve into a first-rate caricature within no time. Initially, my caricature of Rao slightly resembled him. But then came a time when my caricature of Mr. Rao and Rao himself started looking like clones. And during the last time of his tenure, what happened was that my caricature looked more like him than he himself did. <laughs> so the beauty of a caricature is when you capture the personality so truly that it represents the, the essence of that person more than he himself does. And uh, when I talk about Mr. Vajpayee, I would say that he is not somebody who inspires a cartoonist. But when your government, government falls in 13 days, you deserve to be on that uh, little three-column frame in, on the front page of the newspaper. He has been pushed into situations where he has always been at the mercy of the cartoonist. When Jalalita pounced upon him and mauled him, he became a darling of the cartoonist. And I remember I've done one cartoon which, uh, in which I'd drawn a huge Jalalita sitting on Mr. Advani, Mr. Vajpayee, and Mr. Advani is telling him, Mr. Vajpayee, under the weight of Vajalalita, is struggling to, you know, breathe. And Advani is telling him, don't worry, we won't succumb under pressure. <laughs> so what happened was that Jalalita made life difficult for him and life easy for us. For a long time, she was uh, making Vajpayee's life very difficult. So Vajpayee has remained one of uh, our favorite characters in the past few years, in spite of the fact that he's not cut out to be one. But because he's doomed to be a cartoonist darling, whether India was shining or not, Atalji and his colleagues were shining in our cartoons. And let me admit that uh, all of us cartoonists really felt very good throughout Mr. Atal Bihari Vajpayee's tenure. The cartoon has come of age in India. It has become an integral part of uh, journalism and democracy. And democracy and freedom, I, would, I believe, that are lifeblood of cartooning. A cartoonist cannot function and survive without his freedom. That is one of the reasons why cartooning has flourished in countries where you have democracy. You'll never see a cartoonist in a dictatorship. In countries like Russia, you had quite a few, in fact, many social cartoonists, but you would never have a polit political cartoonist. And uh, Abu Abraham had very rightly said once that nobody gives you freedom on a platter. You have to assert your freedom. But in India, I say that religion is one subject which is a taboo in cartoons also. And I have uh, had the experiences of doing some cartoons on such a theme. And uh, I remember that when Lord Ganesha was drinking milk, I had done a cartoon in which I had drawn Mother Dairy Tanker and Lord Ganesha is drinking milk directly from the pipe of the tanker and the driver is telling him that Prabhu all the milk is over, if you want I can offer you some ice cream. <laughs> so early morning a chap comes and rings the bell of my house, I opened the door, he had big, two big packets in his hands, I said uh, what is that? He said sir I have been sent by the Chairman of Mother Dairy, ice cream for you. <laughs> then the telephone started ringing. Some people were very happy with the cartoon because it, it, was, it was a cartoon which uh, not made fun of what happened, but it succinctly and very innocently told the truth. I got telephone calls, many calls came. Some people were very happy, some people were very angry. But at 2 o'clock at night, I got a telephone call from a lady. She said, Mr. Telang. I said, yes. I've been watching your cartoons for many, many years. It's now that you've gone mad. <laughs> you've done a cartoon on Lord Ganesha, and you're going to die within three days. Next day, at three, 2 o'clock again at night, she calls me and tells me, 
one day gone, two days left. <laughs> the second day she calls and tells me, two days gone, only one day left. And the third day at two o'clock at night, she phoned to confirm whether I was actually dead or not. <laughs> but I wasn't. And uh, here I am. So you see that the different kind of reactions that people have to cartoons. And uh, <clears throat> not surprisingly, as I was saying that freedom is very important. Abu perhaps was the only voice of dissent during emergency when newspaper editors were asked to bend, they started crawling. But there was a cartoonist called Abu who actually st stood up to the establishment and drew cartoons against uh, emergency during that time. I would say that after all, cartooning is an art of dissent, it's an art of protest. It is a negative art in a very positive way. Because um, a cartoonist ultimately dreams of a society, of a world, where he has no role to play. I, I dream of a world where I have no role to play. A place where everything is absolutely correct, water is coming in from the taps, you got good roads, you got education for all, you got good health services, you got no party, everybody gets food to eat. That kind of a world, that's what I imagine. And if you are able to realize this dream, then there'll be no, new, no need for a cartoonist. <clears throat> there would be no need for a cartoonist in a utopian world. But fortunately for us and unfortunately for you, such a dream will never happen. We have a very rich tradition of cartooning in India. Politicians have learned to live with their own cartoons. Many of them really enjoy a good cartoon. And um, I must say that uh, even at their expense, I've had the, ex the experience of getting telephone calls from many politicians whenever I have done a cartoon, a hard-hitting cartoon on them, and they have asked for the original drawing. I can quote some of the names here, Vajpayee ji, Advani ji, Murli Manor Joshi, Mr. Madhav of Sindhya, even Rajiv Gandhi. He was also a cartoon lover. And uh, there are many politicians and non-politicians also like uh, the Chief Election Commission, Mr. Gill, Mr. T. N. Session. Many of them have asked for original drawings of their cartoons. And I remember once uh, Mr. Jaswan Singh phoned me one morning when I'd done a cartoon on this Taliban affair. He had gone to uh, Afghanistan to get that uh, plane and I done a cartoon where I had made him in Taliban clothes with a rocket launcher on his uh, shoulder and he's coming into a room where Mr. Vajpayee and Mr. Advani are sitting and Mr. Vajpayee is unable to recognize this man in Taliban clothes so Advani is telling me don't you recognize him he's our friend Jaswan Singh back from Kandhar so Mr. Jaswan Singh phoned me and said I want today's cartoon the original drawing for myself I said uh, Sir, why do you want your cartoon? Because I made you not in a very flattering way. He says, no, I like this cartoon because I'm looking very cute in Taliban clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so this cartoon is with Mr. Jaswan Singh. So there are many occasions like this. And uh, um, I would say that uh, this is a great privilege that uh, the art of cartooning gives you. I have the power to reduce the mightiest people in the land to mere caricatures. That's a great, that's a great license. Years back, a cartoonist had said that there'll be a time when the dividing line between the politician and caricature will disappear. And that will be the most difficult time for the cartoonists. The last decade saw evolution of the politics, politician from the leader to the caricature and later on to the, to, the, to the criminal. Now we are beyond that comic age. In the post-comic era, we are finding it difficult to draw cartoons of people. Because many times what happens is that politicians has replaced the role of the cartoonist and taken over it. People like Lalu Yadav, each sentence they speak is a caricature in, it, in, the, in, in itself. And it's always difficult to draw a caricature of a caricature. The 21st century began on a sad note with a war, an attack on uh, world trade towers. And uh, at times like this, the first casualty, the first casualty is, the, is humor. When there was an attack on the world trade towers, American television stopped one thing. All comedy shows were stopped. 
There was no comedy on TV at that time. Now let me come back to the question that I had raised in the beginning, that is cartooning dying? I would like to tell you that a few weeks back, a young man, a young cartoonist, a very talented cartoonist from South India came to me. What had happened with the poor chef was that uh, he was working with the newspaper and his editor had stopped using his cartoons. He told me that one fine morning, his editor called him to his cabin. Editor said, I'm rather sad at the state of cartooning in the world. He had a very grim expression on his face. The art of political cartooning is dying, the editor said. The young cartoonist was rather, was rather touched and uh, he was quite moved by the editor's, editor's concern about the state of cartooning in India and the world. So this young cartoonist gathered some courage and asked the editor, Sir, if the art of cartooning is dying, then you should encourage it rather than killing it. Sir, you have no cartoons in your paper. So this editor says that, do you know that the cartooning is dead in England? They don't use front page cartoons on the uh, front page pocket cartoons in their newspapers. And he had three of the papers which he put on the, on the, on the table. The Observer, The Guardian and The Telegraph. But to the horror of the editor, all three had pocket cartoon on the front page. So the young cartoonist was quite happy and editor was a slightly red in the face. But the editor said, so what if they use pocket cartoons? Actually, they have stopped using the big political cartoons. There are no political cartoons. And then he opened the paper. In all the three papers, on the op-ed page, there were six column big political cartoons. So the editor was really shocked, but he didn't lose hope. He said, so what? Maybe art of cartooning is not dead in England. But I'm absolutely sure that political cartooning is dead in India. And I have a proof. Then he brought out his own paper and said, look, in our own paper, there are no cartoons. So let me assure you that cartooning is not going to die. It's not dead in England. It's not going to die in Germany or France or America or any other country. And it won't be dead in India as well. For so long as there will be a Lalu or a Jayalalitha or a Mulayam Singh Yadav or Sonia Gandhi or Atal Bihari Vajpayee or El Kedwani, there will be an R.K. Lakshman, there will be a Sudhir Tailang, there will be a Unni, there will be a Ravi Shankar, there will be a Najit Nainan, and there will be a Kuti or, a, or anybody else. If we have survived as a nation for thousands of years, it's because of our sense of humor. And we will only if we have it. Thank you very much.